Welcome to the Divisional Round Power Rankings. I'm Brandon Perna. Today we're going to rank the top eight teams heading into this weekend. If you don't know, every Power Ranking show, if you're new here, I spin this curse wheel to see which team it curses. This guy was on a tear, but lately his curses have been wrong. I spun it the opposite direction last week, so maybe it blessed the Packers. Regardless, I'll spin it at the ep end of the episode to see which team it curses. And we added the refs. I figure we should put the refs into the mix, see if we can curse the refs. But let's start at number nine, not ass. Congrats, Rams. You're the only team who lost on Wild Card Weekend that didn't end up looking like complete ass. Now, a big reason for that is Sean McVay and Les Snead executed one of the most fair trades in NFL history. Winning a Super Bowl with the quarterback you traded for only to lose to the QB you traded away in the playoffs? Even Stevens. Immediately, the Rams won the Super Bowl in 2021, and there's no doubt that Stafford is the catalyst for that jump. The Lions start to rise while the Rams fall off, and then in 2023, they meet in the middle and have a close game that illustrates just how two-sided that trade was. From now on, I think every trade should have to go through Sean McVay so he can sign off on its fairness with either a yeah bro or a nah dude. If Denver had to run the Russell Wilson trade through Sean McVay and his filter, we would have ended up getting two first round picks from Seattle. Number eight, I've got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, Baker Mayfield was only slated to make four mil this year. He made 250,000 in incentives when he threw three touchdown passes to beat the Eagles on Monday night. If he goes into Detroit and upsets the Lions, he'll earn another 250K. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if he did that, even as six point road underdogs. Just remember, Baker needs that money. As we learned in the offseason that his dad essentially lost 12 million as he was in charge of investing it or some shit. The only greater motivation than money is sex. And Baker is now financially motivated to beat Goff. One of the big things that stuck out though from the Buccaneers home win over Philly was Todd Bowles and his ability to trust his young guys. Two of his youngest and most inexperienced defenders, uh, undrafted rookie Christian Izine and second year Zion McCollum uh, got more snaps than experienced players like Ryan Neal and Kayvon Merriweather and it paid off against Philly. Of course, this time they're going to have to face a team who does have its number one receiver available in Amon Ra. Ra ra ra, ra ra, ra ra. I'm not gonna do it right now, St. Brown. A quarterback who's not banged up and an opposing defense that actually knows how to tackle. Of course, there's a challenge uh, they're facing that no one was prepared for. The Buccaneers will be the first team to play outdoors in Detroit since 1974. Special plans to acclimate the team to not only uh, endure, but perform in those kind of frigid temperatures should you face them in Detroit. You do know we play indoors, right? They got a dome. I don't, um, no, nothing. Number seven, the Packers. Now the Packers feel like the team nobody wants to play right now. Jordan Love was, my, in my opinion, a little bit better than even rookie CJ Stroud last week. Aaron Jones is better than the Texans rushing attack and the Packers receivers are healthier than the Texans wideouts. So why on earth do I have Green Bay behind the Texans here in the power rankings? Actually, I don't. I just convinced myself to swap them. Number seven, the Texans. The Texans and Ravens actually played week one and Baltimore handled business 25 to nine. Both teams have come a long way since that game. And if you recall, CJ Stroud made some nice throws, but he was sacked five times. He was sacked six times the following week against the Colts. We were all worried he wouldn't survive the season. He then went three straight games without getting sacked and Cleveland got to him zero times in Houston's big playoff win. Texans O-line versus Ravens stout D-line, that's the biggest matchup in this game. One of the more under the radar players though this season has been Texans veteran corner Desmond King. A guy we haven't talked about much since well, since his All-Pro honors back in 2018, really. He had 12 tackles on Saturday, more than any other player all weekend, in addition to spinning on Joe Flacco's head. King was with the Texans in 2021 and 2022, but started this season with the Steelers before they released him a few games into the season, and he signed back with the Texans. 
Hilarious because he led wildcard weekend in tackles and the Steelers trailed only the Eagles in missed tackles. Might have wanted to keep him. It helps that Derek Stingley is playing like a top 10, maybe top five corner as well this year. Stingley is tied with the 49ers, Charvarius Ward and the Bills, Rasul Douglas with five picks on the season. That's a three-way tie for uh, most of any players remaining in the postseason. Good for second most uh, altogether this season. Now, Nico Collins, will need to dominate for Houston to win. They lost Noah Brown to injury, which means Collins needs to be unguardable against one of the best defenses in the NFL. Or John Mechie and Brevin Jordan need to step up for the now dwindling Texans ball catching core. Number six, for real this time, the Packers. Initially, I had the Texans ahead because I need one more game to believe the Packers defense is good. The 49ers will have a much better attack plan against Joe Barry's crew. That matchup scares the shit out of me if I am a Packers fan. And when I say scares the shit out of me, what I mean is no amount of cheese consumption could keep that shit compacted and constipated within my body in terms of the fear I have of that chess match. Kyle Shanahan is the Queen's Gambit and Joe Barry, well, He's playing Jenga. Here's the caveat though. Christian McCaffrey strained his calf a few weeks ago. Joe Burrow put calf injuries on the map this season. And even though Run CMC was a full go at practice this week after ample rest, that's an injury that's tricky and can flare up easily. Opposite CMC though, you got Aaron Jones. 49ers, unfortunately, for the Packers have the third best run defense this season. And if they slow down Aaron Jones, Green Bay has an uphill battle. Why does everything always come down to an errand for the Packers? Today's episode is sponsored by Underdog Fantasy. Check it out. Underdog has a Lamar Jackson special this week in the Pick'em games. He's got a half yard gimme if you enter a Pick'em contest. Since Joe Flacco had more than a half yard against the Texans defense, this feels like a safe move. Pick'em games or variations of the Pick'em games are now available in all of the states you see here. A couple new states have been added, so look at that map carefully, like you're trying to pass a geography test. I've also created a couple private drafts linked below. These are small three to four person drafts, so you have a good chance at winning, ranging from 10 to 25 to $100 drafts. The drafts start as soon as the league fills up, so pay attention to that. Sign up at Underdog with my link below or my code that's good. Make your first deposit and they're going to match that up to $100. Code that's good at Underdog. Number five, it's the Kansas City Chiefs. The big question surrounding the Chiefs is pretty simple. Were they playing possum all year, saving all their juice for the playoffs? Or were the Dolphins in the freezing cold the easiest matchup they could have possibly faced? Not to give a, a cop-out answer, but I think uh, both might be true. The Chiefs had no problem against Miami in frigid conditions, and now they have to travel to Buffalo, and they'll face the rival Bills in frigid conditions. What I love about this matchup is both teams are coming off disgustingly cold games where they punch their opponents square in the mouth. And the winner of this game will walk out having... Leo for the mail. And as you've probably heard, this is the first road playoff game of Patrick Mahomes career, which is technically true, but not really true because Super Bowl 55 against the Buccaneers was of course played in Tampa Bay. And that didn't go too well, if my memory serves me correctly. Is that the game where Mahomes had the best com incompletion ever? I don't have any doubt in my mind that this will be a one score game. Their last three matchups were exactly that. A six point difference in the famous 13 seconds game, a four point Buffalo win in 2022, and earlier this season, a three point win for Buffalo after Kadarius Tony was correctly called offsides before the biggest play of the game. The Bills held Najee Harris, uh, and Jalen Warren to 75 rushing yards. So the challenge is for the Chiefs. If the Bills can slow down running with the seizure, Isaiah Pacheco and limit Rishi Rice, then it's gonna be a Travis Kelsey game. He's going to need to have the biggest game of the year for Kansas City to get the win. Number four, the Lions. Uh, the Buccaneers, despite finishing the season just nine and eight, had a winning record on the road. Now we can obviously point to the fact that these two teams played all the way back in October, a game in Tampa that the Lions won 20 to six. While Goff played lights out, Baker had one of his worst games of the season, and neither team could run the ball against each other. Rashad White was the leading rusher for both teams, 
and he had uh, seven carries for 26 yards. I think the Lions are going to make sure very early, like they did against the Rams, that they have more than 40 yards on the ground this time around. You have the number one rushing offense in the Lions going up against a team that finished top five in rushing yards allowed. Once again, something's gotta give. Aiden Hutchinson had two sacks last week. He's the only remaining player who had two sacks in the wild card round. I look for him to get two in this game as well. And after seeing Lions lineman Taylor Decker just dunk, and I mean dunk on Scooter on Twitter, and then learning Jared Goff might be a good two feet taller than Baker Mayfield, give me the Lions by a million. Number three, it's the Bills. All season long, we asked, when is Josh Allen going to stop turning the ball over? When's he going to play smarter? Guess what, fuckheads and fuck fingers and fuck elbows? He was simply waiting for the playoffs. No turnovers, four total touchdowns, and he's going to give the Bills a real chance against one of the best defenses in the NFL. In fact, he's going to make them look fucking stupid. Like I've said a thousand times before, any team that can stop Mason Rudolph can stop Patrick Mahomes. And Buffalo just did that. One of the most important players on the Chiefs roster is corner Legereus Sneed. He put the clamps on Tyreek Hill at the line of scrimmage and has been a dog all year long, really. I'd imagine Spags has Sneed line up at the line of scrimmage and assault Stephon Diggs all game which is why the Bills better hope Gabe Davis is ready to go and return from injury and stretch that field. Diggs hasn't really had a huge game in months, so that's not a problem for the Bills. Tight ends Dawson Knox and Dalton Kincaid scored the first two touchdowns last weekend, and I hope they outshine Travis Kelsey so brightly that Kelsey gets fucking sunburned. The bad injury news is that Bills linebacker Terrell Bernard at the very least has an ankle sprain. The good news is that's much better than what we initially thought when he was carted off the field against the Steelers. He needs to play in this game. And what he's done through the course of the season after Matt Milano went down is spectacular. He was straight balling against the Steelers and I wanna watch him break up some passes going to Kelsey and stuff Pacheco at the line of scrimmage. The other good news, Rasul Douglas should return as well. He uh, said he could have played against the Steelers. They rested him, and I'm betting my life he has a key interception in the second half of this game. Most importantly, the Bills have found a way to break their curse. Someone fell into the pit outside of their stadium. That pit is where the new stadium is being built. The Bills won that week, and since then, some person has offered themselves as sacrificed and jumped into the pit. Bills Mafia has smartly been sacrificing themselves since that moment. And as long as they feed the pit... Buffalo all the way this time! Number two, the 49ers. Getting the one seed is a really good thing. Don't get me wrong, you want that bye week. But there has to be something kind of scary about watching a red hot Packers team that's so much better than their record go into Dallas and throttle the Cowboys. Meanwhile, the 49ers haven't played meaningful football since 2023, and they haven't been tested since Christmas night when they lost handily to the number one team on today's list. But I don't think that rust will last for more than say a quarter. Uh, if it's there at all. All I'm saying is that the 49ers are 10 point favorites and that feels a little high given everything we've learned about Green Bay over the last month. The last good team the 49ers bested was really the Buccaneers on November 19th. This is also a great opportunity for the 49ers to show what they could have done last year if they hadn't lost Brock Purdy in the championship game. And I honestly think that this Packers team might be the toughest competition left in the conference, especially considering LaFleur and Shanahan know each other so well. Number one, yeah, it's the Ravens still. As good as John Harbaugh and Lamar Jackson have been together, the elephant in the room is that they've only won one playoff game together in four tries. Does that matter Saturday? Probably not, because this is a healthier and a better team than the Ra Ravens had in 2020, the last time Lamar Jackson started a playoff game. And like the Texans, they're also a better team than they were back in week one when they beat Houston. 
The most important player for the Ravens might not even play. I'm talking about Mark Andrews, who returned to practice last week and then apparently took a big step towards playing this week at practice. Here's my hot take though. If he's not, absolutely 100% don't play him. I think the Ravens might be better with Isaiah Likely right now, who's had five touchdowns in their last five games. Likely is playing better than Andrews was this season. Don't get me wrong, having both of them makes Baltimore scary, but not if Mark Andrews is less than 100% and if he's taking away opportunities from Likely. Likely, I'm going to spin this wheel. Likely, all right, let's see who this wheel curses. The numbers have been reordered. Everything is different about this curse wheel. Except for the fact that I gotta hold it up because it can't stand on its own stick. Who do we curse? Mr. Curse Wheel. Oh, we almost got those refs. We almost got those son of a bitch refs. Number eight. Oh, not Baker Mayfield and the upstart Buccaneers. Wear a diaper. Go Lions, go Bills. Thanks for watching Power Rankings. Please subscribe here on YouTube. If you made it this far into the video and you uh, don't find me incredibly annoying, um, 